Over the past few weeks, Turkey has been engaging in a number of diplomatic maneuvers. A key moment was the recent NATO summit when it dropped its objection to the induction of Finland and Sweden. Turkey claimed that the two countries had been forced to accept its concerns and demands regarding the Kurdistan Workers' Party, which Turkey considers a terrorist group. Turkish President Erdogan and his supporters have portrayed this as a big victory for the country. Why did Turkey object to the induction of Finland and Sweden into NATO? And what did it achieve at the NATO summit? Rania Khalik of Breakthrough News explains. So it looks like Finland and Sweden, after uh, basically pushing uh, Turkey to accept them, will now become members of NATO. Now, Finland and Sweden were officially neutral for decades. And I say officially neutral because in reality, they weren't actually neutral. I mean, Sweden has been thoroughly integrated into the NATO security architecture. Uh, And, you know, you could go back even further. I mean, Sweden played a crucial role in basically helping Nazis flee uh, the region after their defeat in World War II. Uh, Finland is more of like a frontline state with Russia and has a historical memory of conflict with it. Um, And in fact, it seems the Swedes were actually surprised by this sudden sort of Finnish decision to join NATO. And it pressured them into making a move they would, I don't think, have otherwise done because, but they they didn't want to leave Finland alone. So immediately after the Finnish decision, the far right in Sweden, which is becoming increasingly powerful in parliament, you know, vociferously jumped on board of joining NATO. And normally the Swedish government could have ignored this, but with elections a few months away and the government worried about losing to the right, they felt they had to take the same position, which they might, again, not have where there are no elections soon. Um, so it overturns basically 200 years of what I said, official neutrality, uh, even if they were already integrated and in, unofficially into NATO. So they hadn't been a part of the defense pact. The Swedish military, of course, will, will like this because it means bigger budgets. You know, Sweden has quite a sophistic- has quite sophisticated uh, fighter jets and a very powerful Navy. And it's in fact, one of the largest exporters of military technology in the world, despite its reputation as like a happy, peaceful socialist paradise. And South Africa and Brazil and a few other countries actually use their fighter jets. Um, And the US Navy is even jealous of the Swedish Navy because their submarines outperformed the American Navy in the past. So, and in fact, you know, the Saudis had long been one of the top purchasers of Swedish weapons. and, And this was temporarily halted a few years back when there was a crisis in Swedish-Saudi relations after the Swedish foreign minister described Saudi Arabia as a medieval society and condemned its human rights abuses. Swedish corporations, by the way, were like furious about this and then pressured the government to mend the broken ties. And eventually relations were restored. Um, And that might actually be why the UN special envoy to Yemen is Swedish. So they can like maybe feel better about themselves for putting the gun in Saudi Arabia's hand while also trying to end the war. Anyway, that's all aside, you know, the obstacle to Finland and Sweden joining NATO, as you, you mentioned, was Turkey's Erdogan, who was very upset about their support for the PKK run autonomous administration in the American occupied uh, Northeast of Syria. And as well for the presence of these alleged PKK members in Finland and Sweden. So one reason for Swedish support for the Kurdish Autonomous Administration is uh, one Swedish member of parliament of Kurdish origin who actually could have brought down the government if she didn't get her way during a crisis having to do with the Minister of Justice and pressure from the right uh, played a role there. However, Erdogan is like this ultimate pragmatist and was just using his leverage to extract some concessions. So he wanted the Swedish ban on selling weapons to Turkey removed and a commitment that uh, these wanted PKK members would be extradited to Turkey before he would agree to allow Sweden and Finland to join NATO. So Sweden and Finland both consider the PKK a terrorist organization, as does the US, as does Turkey. So in theory, they will comply with that. But the question is, who counts as PKK? And if you actually read the fine print, you see that it's going to be contingent on human rights compliance. So if you really think about it, Turkey kind of just got a symbolic victory here. Uh, Turkey recently sent this like th- th- uh, philanthropist and activist Osman Kavala to prison for a lifetime in solitary confinement with zero possibility of parole. So Turkey's standards for individual liberty are much different than the Scandinavian standards. 
but you know, money and power are more important than these concerns. So we'll see. But in addition, you know, the Swedish prime minister started engaging with Erdogan. So he made, he made this point and then ultimately agreed. So that's one side. Uh, that's basically what took place is now, you know, people are rightfully upset that there's a possibility though. Again, I think this was still symbolic that the Finnish and Swedish governments could extradite, uh, you know, wanted PKK members to Turkey who would then face, you know, very harsh conditions. Turkey has also taken a very aggressive position in Syria, where it has said it intends to invade again and secure territory to house refugees from the decade-long conflict. What is Erdogan's plan in the region and how does he seek to achieve it? So Turkey has been increasing its attacks on PKK targets in Syria and Iraq, uh, which of course also led to civilian casualties. But the U.S., which protects the Kurds in northeast Syria, and I use protects in big quotes, I mean, they essentially use them to occupy a chunk of northeast Syria to make to, you know, as pressure against the government of Bashar al-Assad in their ongoing uh, attempt to weaken and perhaps, you know, overthrow that government. But the U.S., which acts as a protector of the Kurds in the northeast of Syria, can't really object to Turkey doing this because Turkey provides Ukraine with essential weapons in in the war in Russia, uh, especially with the Turkish drones. And so the Turks have all, you know, this is because the Turks have basically been angry for years about the US creation of this, essentially what is like a PKK, like statelet in Northeast Syria and US support for the PKK. The US does this under the auspices, by the way, of the Syrian Democratic Forces, what they call the SDF, but it's really just, the Syrian uh, branch of the PKK, which is called the YPG. And my apologies for all of these acronyms, but there are so many. Uh, But essentially the SDF is just the YPG or PKK under a different name. Um, So the US military support for this group, you know, has made the organization really more powerful than it's ever been. And it's also increased its influence in Iraq spreading from its kind of like mountain stronghold in Kandil down to Sinjar and Nineveh province in Iraq. So the Turks have been increasingly nervous about this, which explains their uh, sort of ongoing pursuit of the PKK through these, you know, various incursions and bombing and bombing campaigns in both Iraq and Syria. In another major development, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman visited Turkey recently, marking a major step in the rapprochement between the two countries. Ties had soared after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in 2018. What has led to this change in the dynamics between these two regional powers? And what does it bode for the future? So just as Erdogan has reconciled with these aspiring NATO members, Finland and Sweden, he's also made a much more shocking reconciliation with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, or as we know him, MBS. Uh, So Turkish ties with the Saudis and the Emiratis had collapsed during the Arab Spring, uh, and Turkey at that time had allied with their rival, Qatar. So Turkey even blamed the Emirates for supporting an attempted coup against Erdogan. So that is kind of another, you know, um, reason behind Turkey's resentment towards these particular Gulf states. However, in the last year, as we've seen this kind of regional rapprochement with countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran and Qatar and Egypt and Turkey and the UAE kind of all improving ties and de-escalating from past tensions. You know, the Turks had um, had squeezed a lot out of the Saudis after the former Saudi spy and friend of bin Laden turned traitor, turned Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi was murdered and chopped into pieces in the Saudi consulate in in Istanbul. Uh, But Turkey is like undergoing this horrible financial crisis. Uh, It has been for a while and it keeps getting worse. So it needs to improve ties with the Saudis for the same reason that, you know, Biden is now breaking his word and meeting with MBS, right? It's completely out of convenience. So recently Turkey, it's important to note, had also greatly improved relations with Israel after years of tensions with this visit of the Israeli president to Turkey and then Turkish intelligence cooperating with the Mossad to, you know, quote unquote, protect Israelis from alleged kidnapping or assassination attempts uh, for Israeli assassinations of Iranians. So in order to improve ties with Israel, Turkey had to improve uh, ties with, uh, or had to, I'm sorry, had to promise in order to improve ties with Israel, 
Turkey had to promise to reduce Hamas activities in its territory. And this is just as an order like to improve ties with Egypt. Turkey also promised to reduce Muslim Brotherhood activities and media in its tor- territory. So this is this kind of improvement of ties with Saudi Arabia is part of an ongoing pattern across the region of, you know, Turkey kind of like making deals here and there with, you know, frenemies, if you will, uh, for its own, you know, domestic reasons. 